amazing because as a piece of technology, we understood the things like iPhones, but how much it would become personal, a part of you like another limb. It's Absolutely. just it's just amazing. People didn't just fall in love with them, but almost have to live by it. It's almost like you're, you're, you're key to the world now. Absolutely. You must yeah. have seen how many people own, not only you that has more than one phone, but oh, sure. almost everyone that he has seen here in Kuwait has more than one phone. And they tend to have the phones that I've considered the best. <laughs> <laughs> the Galaxy S4, the HTC One, and the Galaxy Note, and Absolutely. the iPhone, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I guess uh, it's been a while that we've been waiting for some of the crowd. Actually, all the seats were reserved. Uh, luckily that uh, we have managed to get the crowd get into place because we were having heavy rain, like you know, Mr. T. And uh, I'm sure we'll be joined in probably in the next half an hour with the rest and the And we um, might announce when we're done, we do have some, I'll stick around to meet people individually that want to take the time, photographs, autographs, whatever, just talk to me. <laughs> Hour, two hours, however long. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, we have actually discussed the main topics that we would think that would be interesting to our audience. We're talking about sounds of Apple around the world as well as specifically the sounds of Apple here in Kuwait who would want to learn from you, who are already inspired by your own story, and who would like to actually get out from this session with the best practice or best success story that they could live onward with. So how about we start with the journey of Apple? The journey of Apple, well, started with inspiration. You've always got to be have an inspiration to do things in your life. And for me, I was around an electronics area. A lot of young people understood electronics, and we were able to take soldering irons and build little devices that did strange things for young children. Maybe they made tones, maybe they let us run wires between our houses and set up our own little personal telephone system in the neighborhood. Well, this was our fun. It was really fun for us, but it was like reading stories about inventors of the old times, you know, that made me think, wow, I want to be one of those guys that you know has his own company or goes into the laboratory and builds a device that solves a big problem and helps the world. Engineering to me was always had a dual purpose. It had to be a lot of goodness attached to it. We were gonna try, we were gonna change life always to make it better, to give people more free time, more leisure, you wouldn't have to work as hard. Of course, here it is 50 years later, and <laughs> we're now we're it take, you have to it takes family like two people in a family working full time stressful jobs just to own a home in Silicon Valley. Mm -hmm. So we didn't get the free time all that much, but that's partly because it's been so successful and so intriguing the technology of it is. I started out, you know, you start out young, and the funny thing is, if you start out when you're young, I go back to my own youth and I think today's youth, I was told, you are the, gonna fix the world, you are the future, you're gonna build the world that we haven't made that good yet. And, you know, and I go back and I think of all my little technical, learning engineering, learning to build things, learning how televisions work, stumbling into computer logic, discovering that it was easy to learn for a young child. And the funny thing is, every single thing that's in every computer has no mathematics that's beyond the level of a 10-year-old child. Wow. That was one of the lucky discoveries I made when I was 10 years old, and I said, oh, this is gonna be my favorite thing in life, even though no other children do this. You know, because back then computers were, you never thought you'd ever design computers, invent computers. You never thought that computers were further out than rocket science. They were not heard of. You'd never expect to see a computer in your life. They were in magazine stories. They were in, in places called research in the military. So I stumbled into it by accident. We didn't have anything in our schools that helped me out. But I did have a lot of things. I had right people around me that had little electronic parts, the parts that you build bigger things out of. And my father had connections to get a lot of early devices called transistors. Transistors are the heart of everything electronic in the world that does all the great things for us. When you hold up your cell phone, yes, it has, you've heard of the word chips. Silicon Valley is where chips come from. They come from silicon. And the chips have billions of transistors on them now. But transistors are doing all of the little tiny thinking that adds up to the big thinking. 
So I discovered this, and wow, if I hadn't been inspired to go this direction, I wouldn't be here. But it wasn't in school. It was all on my own. When you do things on your own, it's for your own personal learning. And of course, I grew up with a lot of other kids that were talented in electronics, but I was excelling. You know, For some reason, I was winning all the top math awards and electronics awards and science fairs and things. Well, when I met Steve Jobs, he was also interested in electronics, but he wasn't like I was. I, was, I could design any computer there was in the world in about two days on paper with pencil. I could sit down and design all the parts that would build that computer and draw it, but I could never afford a single part. And that was lucky, because probably if I had ever been able to design something, buy the parts and build it, I might have stopped. Kept going and going and going. You know, when you start getting good at something, A, you decide that's valuable for the world, and B, you want to keep proceeding to do the same thing a little better, a little better, a little better. Every project you've ever done in your life, no matter what, you're, what you do for your life, every project you do takes the learning that you've gotten from every project before it, and you always do a little better. You never go backwards. You only go forwards in being able to do things better and better. So I met Steve Jobs, and uh, it was a time of a counterculture movement. A lot of people in the San Francisco area talking about different ways to live your life, and a lot of it were called hippies. And Steve Jobs was younger than I was. He was 16 at the time. He was more going to live his life with no money and just carry around bags of seeds to eat and, and just sandals or bare feet and somehow hang around all the people that had no money. Because when you're young, you know a lot of people that are like that and you want to be a part of it to find yourself. And of course, Steve also talked about the great people, the ones that win Nobel Prizes, the ones that do incredible mathematics, the ones like William Shakespeare that move us forward in literature. And he wanted to be one of those great people somehow, but he didn't know the formula. Like a lot of young people, he was searching for his way. I had a very different story. I was so excellent at electronics my whole life that from high school on, I never had to worry about a job. I would be able to, to go out without having an engineering degree or anything. I'd be able to go out on the street and get a job, and I didn't have to worry about what I was going to do. I was going to be an engineer, like my father before me. And I was going to be an electrical engineer, and I was going to design televisions and radios. I never in my life thought that engineers designed computers. That sort of came about by accident. I just loved computers. It was the thing that I would do for no grade in school, no money, no nothing. It was just a passion in me to try to design them over and over and over, making them better and better and better. The same computer models that were manufactured by companies like Hewlett Packard and Digital Equipment Corporation. Now, it got to a point, though, if you can look at somebody else's, somebody else's project and design your version of it, that's one thing. But it's not totally creating your own new thing in the world. There's a difference, there's a difference between buying a kit of parts and a set of instructions like IKEA furniture, and it shows you how to put it together. There's a difference to stepping up and totally making your own, maybe sawing the wood or designing your own little circuits and parts. And I crossed over that barrier very early in my life to where if I knew what I wanted in the end, I could design it on paper and I could build it. I was a builder, built a lot of huge things with hundreds of parts. And I think that's a very important part of life. Almost all the people I know that are successful in running technology companies, when you go back into their childhood, they were building projects, building things, taking things apart, putting them back together, trying to make changes to them sometimes to improve them. Um, well, it turns out that uh, Steve and I started off, okay, we, we, we had similar philosophies about life and how people would treat other people. And we were, I liked the counterculture movement because it said, you don't have to grow up with one way of thinking of how to live life. There are alternatives. I wasn't going to be a part of that. I was not a hippie. I wasn't going to use drugs or anything like that. But I kind of admired the fact that people thought about ways to do things that were different. I was such an electronic genius that the people in school wouldn't talk to me. They kind of thought I was strange, I didn't talk their language, I didn't, couldn't go to parties. Um, I was a very much an outsider, a loner. Yes, I got a lot of awards for academics in school, but I didn't really know how to, how to talk to people the normal way. That made me very independent. When you're shy, you spend a lot of time alone and your head dreams thoughts. 
and dreaming is a large part of creating new projects of the world and not just coming up with a simple idea but thinking about it over weeks of time maybe thinking about it while you're falling asleep waking up with answers in the middle of the night um, this was the sort of life I led. I was very independent. I would learn things out of a book. I would teach myself. I would learn how to write the book. I didn't have to be f um, fed everything like everyone else. I was very independent. If people did not agree with my ideas on things, I didn't care. As long as I believe in it, that's all that matters. They can believe their way. I can believe my way. I'm not going to argue. One of the things my father told me is when you get into business, how high up you go and how far you go depends upon how well liked you are. So I determined that I always wanted to be very well liked, whatever I did in, in business. That was much more important and I didn't need to win arguments. Um, sometimes you can be very correct about things in life or even things in mathematics and have trouble getting people to accept it and believe that you are right and agree with you. Um, so Steve Jobs and I, uh, were, we both had electronics interests. But I was the real master at designing things. Steve never really became um, a, a, a designer, an inventor. He never created hardware. He never wrote software programs. He pretty much understood it, though, from his background of taking electronics at the high school. Now, I drove Steve up to college when he went to college. And he wouldn't take any of the classes because he didn't want them picking his courses. He wanted to take the exotic, quantum physics and Shakespeare and calligraphy and really interesting things in college and just be exper experiencing other bright people. He didn't want to tell them you will take these classes. And I said, Steve, that's how it works. Your first two years of college, you don't get a lot of choice. But he just really didn't go through college the normal way. Um, I, had worked, I had gone to two years of college doing very well and I took one year off not to go into business just to earn the money, to work and earn the money for my third year of college. And it was during that year off that I met Steve Jobs. Then I went back to my third year of college. Wow, that was great. I just took graduate courses in hardware and software design, computers. I made the dean's list. And after that year, I took another year off to earn the money for my fourth year of college, just so I could pay my own way. I got some great jobs. Hewlett Packard was making the hot product of the, of the day. Today you hold your smartphone. You say, this is the greatest thing ever made. Well, back then it was the Hewlett Packard handheld scientific calculator. It did the calculations every engineer and every scientist needed to do that they used to do with slide rules. Slide rules are like rulers. You kind of look with your eyeball and you estimate where it is between 1.21 and 1.22, you estimate on a slider, ugh, it was awful. You could make mistakes. You didn't have very high precision. Hewlett Packard came out with a calculator that you typed in any number of digits you wanted and you said take a complicated function and the number of the digits popped up in the display. Every engineer and every scientist had to have this calculator. Within about five years, there were no more slide rules being sold in the United States. It was that successful a product, and it cost a couple thousand of today's dollars. This tool was so important. Well, they heard that I was some kind of great designer of computers. So they brought me into Hewlett Packard, and they interviewed me, and gave me a job offer on the spot. I got to design the hottest product in the world. How lucky could you ever be? It's like, imagine that you love your Apple products, and you get to work for Apple Computer Company. Um, people that are lining up just to get jobs in the stores, come from that kind of background these days. So I say, take the opportunity when it comes. While I was working at Hewlett Packard, um, I had little chance of having a girlfriend or a wife because I was just too technical. And so what I did was after designing calculators in the daytime for Hewlett Packard, I came home and I worked on my own little projects that were digital projects. I had access to the parts to build them now that I worked at Hewlett Packard. And that's one thing I think that young people need, finding their way, is not just outlets where they can gather and have tools and have equipment and computers that help them learn how to build their own things. These places are called hacker spaces and they're called maker, maker places and things like that. Um, but they just, they, they, they should also provide a lot of 
parts, whether it's metal that you cut or wood that you cut or chips that you build things out of, the parts that you actually build things out of, make them highly available and tell young people, build whatever you want for your own life for yourself. When you're motivated, that's when you when things are important to you. That's when you do your best, and that's the life I led. So um, I started building some of the great products. Video games were taking off. Atari Corporation was creating an entirely new industry. Uh, you would go into um, where you used to have pinball games and play pinball. You could now have a pong game and play it with little dials and controls and play ping pong on a television display. A television display was very, very important. For computers, my whole life designing computers, I knew that I could never build one. I knew that I could never afford one. My father said they cost as much as a house, and I told him, I'm going to live in an apartment. I'm going to have a computer someday. And that, was, that was true. So they cost so much, but the main cost was input and output. Since I knew how to design computers, I could build the inside of the computer. But the input output, something you could type on and it would print, chunk, 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 print letters back, was called a teletype. You see these in movies, people type it on these old metal machines. I could never afford one because it costs as much as two cars. But when I saw the Pong, I said, oh my goodness, you can use a television set as your output. And I knew everything about television circuits in the United States because I had studied them in high school. And I knew everything about digital electronics to build very tiny equipment. Everything I designed had to have the fewest parts, absolutely the most efficient designs possible. So I built a Pong with 28 little $1 chips. It sent a signal on one wire that went to a television, and it played the whole game right on your television set. Steve Jobs came back from college around that time, and he saw it. What did he do? He's, he always had more minds of his own way to get into business. He took my board, my Pong game, down to Atari Corporation, who was making the real Pong, and he showed it to them. They were impressed, and they hired him. You know, and he was talking about how these little designs with very few parts, these were the future. And um, Atari gave him a job there. He came to me eventually, and he said, hey, Atari wants a new game to be designed, a one-player Pong game. And I got the chance to do it. I had to do it in four days and nights. Games were hardware. There were no microprocessors. There was no software. You did not program games then. It was so hard to hook wires on pins of chips and make signals dance around on a wire. It was so hard to do that um, I didn't even think I could do it in four days and nights. This was a man-year project. And Steve was in a hurry to get some money or something, so I said I would try. And sure enough, four days and nights, no sleep at all. And funny thing is, when you're not sleeping, it's like when you're falling asleep or you're waking up in the morning, your mind is free to think a lot of the dreams of what the world might be and what products might be. And that was when an idea popped in my head. Instead of the old way that was in all the books to generate color on a television that cost $1,000, I thought of a way to do it with one little chip that cost $1 to generate it a whole different way, a digital way, never in a book, never ever, just out of the blue. So it was a very lucky idea, as it turns out. Well, we got paid money for, um, over and over, I would design things for fun, and Steve Jobs would come and see them, and then he would find a way to turn them into money. So we were just a great partnership. He was the business side, and I was the engineering side. And that was, that's always so important, you know, you have to, you have to, because sometimes the engineers are so good at what they do, but they don't want to do the business. And the businessmen don't understand enough to actually build the products well. So um, it was very lucky we were uh, good friends. Now, we didn't, this was before Apple, and I went through project after project after project, the first hotel movie systems, um, time codes for videotape, all these different things that were electronic projects, and it got me up to the point that I saw the ARPANET. The ARPANET was the first time that the United States government tried to connect universities all across our country together with a network. This had never been done before. It was the forerunner, it was the inspiration of what we call the internet today. But the ARPANET was, we started, we technical people tried to hook universities together. Four universities at first, then five. By the time I saw it, there were eight universities. Stanford, MIT, 
UCLA, UC Santa Barbara, Utah, a bunch of them. And they could all communicate, send data to each other. You could be sitting at one of the, one of the places and work a computer way across the country. I saw this and I was just so amazed and astounded. It was like you were Superman. You could reach out so far and use equipment and communicate with people far away. I had to have it, so I built my own. I built my own. Type on a keyboard, send the data out over a phone line to a faraway computer across the country. And that computer across the country sent its data back over the phone line, and, and I built the device that popped it onto my TV set. So I could actually use computers far away. I felt like Superman. And uh, Steve Jobs found a way to turn that one into money. Time-sharing computers in the old days. They'd have a computer in a building, and companies would rent time on it. They'd pay a certain amount of dollars per month. They could call in with their expensive teletypes or video terminals. They could phone in over modems and run programs to help their businesses go. And the time-sharing outfit rented the terminals, rented the teletypes that they typed on, or rented the video terminals. They saw mine, and mine cost so much less than anything they'd ever seen before. Steve Jobs actually got them to buy some of ours, buy some from us. So we made money again. What year was that? This is 1973 or 74, about this time, a little before Apple. Now, Steve Jobs went back up to Oregon to work with friends on an orchard. And I always hoped there were apple trees there. I never asked. And, and so while he was there, I got in a club, a club of people that were like me. They were talking about how great these small, affordable computers were going to be. Once everyone could afford their own computer, they would be able to write programs and solve problems for their companies. The guy that was never even important in the company but knew computers was now going to be so important as important as the CFO typing in the financial numbers, writing, having little young children write programs that turn out better results than the high-paid programmers. We were rebels. We were revolutionaries. We talked about the word, there's going to be a revolution. The technical revolution of computers that are affordable is going to lead to the social revolution of people being able to do things in their lives they never did before. I was so enthused by this. I took my little terminal that called Follow Faraway Computers and I put the parts on it. A microprocessor is like a small computer in its own. It's one chip. Back then it cost $20, the one that I bought. $20, pop a microprocessor in, pop in memory, because all computers need their own memory. And now I could type into my own computer, and my own computer could type on my television set. And I brought it down to my club of all these people that wanted to start the revolution. And I passed out my designs for free. I said, look, you can get the parts, and you can wire it up yourself, and you can afford your own computer now. And this is a useful computer. Every computer before mine had what's called a front panel. They looked like those big, huge flashing lights and tons of switches that you see in movies and you see in pictures of the old computers. Every computer before had a big front panel of switches, and you would flip the switches up and down and push buttons to get data into memory. Oh, it was a long, tedious process, but we who understood computers loved it. Now, the, um, my computer, you now typed on a keyboard. Instead, you could type data on a keyboard, and it would go into memory, and you could see it on your TV screen. I solved it. I didn't have to have that whole huge front panel. Every computer from that point on, there were people at the club looking over my shoulders. They were going to be designing the next computers. Many companies sprung out of our club trying to build these low-cost computers. And everyone looked over my shoulder and they saw the key. And from that point on in time, no computer had a front panel ever again. They had a keyboard and a video display. It was the only way to build a computer. Now, I hadn't really designed it as a computer. It was, remember, it started out as a terminal that was optimized to talk over a low-speed modem to a computer far away. I modified it into being my own computer very quickly, because it was a quick job. Steve Jobs came back from college one time, and I said, you've got to come down and see this at the club. I brought him down to the club, and I took my television and my little board and of chips and my keyboard. I started typing stuff in and showing. There were people around me that loved to watch what I was doing at the club. I had my own little fan group, about 40 people. And Steve Jobs saw the interest in it. What sprung into his head was, how do we turn it into money? And he said, here's what we'll do. We'll form a company. 
the two of us. Form a company? This is weird. I had a job as an engineer. I didn't need a company. And he said, look, we've been, we've been building stuff for five years and selling it as partners. This time, we might as well have a real company. And he suggested the name Apple Computer. And I said, Apple Computer? What about Apple Records, the Beatles record company? And he said, well, they're a record company. We're a computer company. I said, that's all it takes? And he said, yeah, good. We got Apple Computer as our name. Turns out somebody else had actually given that name to Steve Jobs, but don't worry about it. Um, so we were Apple Computer. We were going to build his idea. Steve had worked in surplus electronics stores. The way they work is they go to big companies that have extra parts that they didn't need to use in making their products, and they just get rid of them for almost zero money. And Steve was very familiar with how to buy parts for six cents that he knew in the, the surplus electronics stores. People came in looking for parts they needed, he could sell it for six dollars. And he was good at that. And I said, whoa, why don't you tell the person you're buying it for, from, for, for six cents from, why don't you tell that person how much it's really worth? And he says, no, 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 they don't have to know. So <laughs> that was his idea of business. Well, he suggested we build a fiberglass board called a PC board, a piece of fiberglass with these little metal traces on it that connect all your chips together. And then the people that wanted to build my computer, instead of spending 20 hours soldering thousands of wires with soldering irons to connect it up and make the chips work, they could just pop their chips into this PC board, pop them in, and solder it in one hour. That would, that would solve one of the big problems in getting your own computer. You didn't have to spend a lot of time building it. And um, we were, so we were going to make these boards for $20 and sell them for $40. So if we made 50 boards, if we made 100 boards, um, actually, actually we made 50 boards, we would earn $1,000. And it was going to cost us about $1,000 to create the PC board, pay somebody who designs PC boards. So uh, I didn't know if we'd ever make a profit. Steve wasn't sure we'd ever make a profit. But it was the two of us, you know, best friends doing their own business. So we formed Apple Computer. Um, I made sure that my company, Hewlett Packard, didn't want it. I wanted, I actually wanted Hewlett Packard to build this machine, the personal computer. They should have done it. I pleaded with them. I told them how much it would cost, how you would build it, how, you, what, how it would work, how you'd sell it. And they turned it down five times they turned me down. Five times. I just couldn't get into computers with Hewlett Packard. But they were not going to build the interesting machine that was going to change the world. The interesting machine is the one you fall in love with. You love playing games on it. You love graphics and animations. You love that it talks to you. And they would have built a boring machine that engineers used because that was Hewlett Packard in the old days. So they turned me down. Steve and I were in business. And right away, we, um, I sold my most valuable possession in my life, my Hewlett Packard calculator to start this company, Apple. And Steve sold something, and we put our money together, and we made our PC board. And right away, Steve called me and said he got a huge order, $50,000. Remember, we were only putting a few hundred dollars in each. We didn't even know if we'd get our few hundred dollars back, and he had a $50,000 order. At that time, my salary as an engineer was $25,000. This is twice my salary. That was scary, so I went to HP's legal department again. I was not going to ever give up my job at Hewlett Packard. I was an engineer for life. I grew up believing in studying things, coming up with logical answers that are def provably correct. That was my life, and, and that was engineering. So I was going to be an engineer forever at Hewlett Packard. It was the greatest company ever for engineers, and I would not give up my job. So um, anyway, we now had a $50,000 order. We had to borrow some money. We had no money, we had no savings accounts, we had no rich friends or relatives, but one friend loaned us $5,000 to help buy some of the parts. The other parts we got, we had 30 days to pay for them. So we built the computers up in 10 days, brought them, we drove them from where they were being manufactured into Steve's garage. We would hook them up to a TV set and make sure they worked, and then we'd put them in boxes and drive them down to a store that paid us cash. We had 30 days to pay for the parts. We built the computers in 10 days, and we got paid cash. That was the financial start of Apple Computer. We were just a little two-person partnership then. 
That's all it was. We didn't have a team of employees in the garage, you know, don't believe it if you see it in the movies, that wasn't the case. 